Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. We surrender our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. Save our soul with the washing of the water of your word. Thank you that salvation is a continual process. That it happened instantaneously in the spirit. That our soul is being saved by the washing of your word. The implanting of the word. And their bodies will be glorified for one day. Thank you for what Jesus has done. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide, be our comforter. Open the eyes of our understanding, bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're continuing with this series about Old Covenant, New Covenant, basically the top. We, you either need to talk louder or we need to turn Someone the fan off. Well, I can't, I don't know how, I can't reach it. Arlen, can you go reach that? Okay. Maybe okay. you can move the mic to the other side. Just, just shut the fan off. We're good. <laughs> there. It's in the back. Just reach up behind it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Arlen, can you go? He's too short. Turn, Turn the off. fan off. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. He can't reach the knob. It's in the back. <laughs> Just reach up behind the motor. <laughs> well, we're going to continue this way. That we've been on a, a series on taking the chains off of liberty. We're Christ has made us free. I mean, if Galatians says, stand fast in the liberty in which Christ has made us free. The problem is, as long as we've been being taught, most, as long as most people have been taught Scripture, they've been taught as much and maybe more about the Old Covenant history than the New Covenant mystery. The Apostle Paul made it clear that God anointed him and appointed him to preach the mystery to the Gentiles, not the history. I believe those two words, history and mystery, is a direct division between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And what most people don't understand is that most people's theology is a mixture between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and that's why we have things screwed up. I tell you, we talked about this in one of our chapters uh, in Romans chapter 7. It literally lays it out to those that know the law that the old covenant is dead and the new covenant is alive. And if you're married to the new covenant, Jesus, and still following the laws of the old covenant, Moses, you're committing spiritual adultery. But the Bible tells us there, I think Joy's going to put it on the screen, Romans 7, verse 4. It says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, and you can say dead to Moses, 
through the law, body of Christ. Well, that's a great communion scripture for those that take communion. And you should be taking communion in remembrance of him, not remembrance of you. <laughs> that would challenge some people. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another. To him who was raised from the dead. That's Jesus. See, the battle isn't against good and bad. The battle's between Moses and Jesus. Wow. That's why you have the struggle in Acts chapter 15. That's why you have the struggle in Acts chapter 21. That's why you have a group of people coming behind Paul preaching circumcision. That you must be circumcised. Just not that. You must follow all the laws of Moses in addition to being born again to be saved. No. Now the battle that we, we face is, you know, the enemy was defeated, but Moses is still alive in so many people's lives in theology. So this, this book, this, this series that we're on is dealing with the separation, taking the chains of the law off the liberty that is in Christ that we're supposed to be standing in. And so we're going to continue in that. Next, next week we're probably going to deal with the difference between the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. Yeah. Because that is a direct reference to an old covenant and new covenant. Yeah, which one did Jesus come to, is, is, said he was going to come and rebuild? The tabernacle of David. Tabernacle of David, not the tabernacle of Moses. You're asking yourself, what the difference? The tabernacle of Moses was full of furniture. And the only furniture, you know, had the table of showbread, you had the lampstand, you had all this, the table of incense. But you know what? It was full of furniture. And at every piece of furniture, there was work to be done. But you know what was it in the tabernacle of Moses? Any kind of chair. Except the mercy seat where God was at. Man. What we need to understand is no place to rest under the old covenant. It was full of works. The tabernacle of David, on the other hand, had no furniture. It was just a place for open worship. Worship praise in the presence of God. And maybe we'll find out next week why it was important that Jesus told Martha when she said, oh, Martha said, Jesus, tell Mary to come help me. In the kitchen, because she was busy working. And Jesus says, wait a minute, there's one thing that's needful. That's to be with me. Wow. Maybe someone's going to get that. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, so that today we're going to talk about something that is uh, another example, I believe, of an absolute total separation, which hopefully explain why in, in 2 Corinthians... Chapter 1, verse, verse 20. And before we read verse 20, we're going to talk about the verses before that. And it says this, uh, verse 15, Joy, if you want to put that on the board. And this confidence I intend to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. To pass by way of you to Macedonia to come again from Macedonia to you be uh, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. And I read that specifically a little to identify the fact that Paul went through different places and one group of people helped him with his provisions to go to another place. That's the way the Holy Spirit worked in this period of time. One place of ministry, going to another place of ministry, and I bring this up to say thank you to those that are here in this building and other places in other cities to help us go to Macedonia and Judea and other cities. So we just say thank you. I read that specifically for that. But it is in context. Therefore, verse 17 says, Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? 
Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, or no, no. No, maybe. In other words, he's going to do this or he's not going to do this. In other words, it's not a fleshly decision. These are decisions made by the Spirit. It's going to be yes and yes or no and no. It's not going to be circumstantial led. Now that's the whole message in itself is being, you know, most people are moved by circumstances. Most people let the circumstances in their life dictate their peace. If the circumstances don't line up, they're not at peace. They're not happy. When the scripture says we should be at peace and we should be happy no matter what the circumstances like, because we understand the hope of the word of God. We know what the word says about us. Verse 18, but as God, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes or no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes or no, but in him, yes. Everybody say yes. 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 <clears throat> For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ, notice how it says that. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ, say in Christ. In Christ. And has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, what's the big deal about this? Is what we need to understand in Scripture that Jesus in Him is yes, and in Him is amen. We're going to talk about those two words, yes and amen. And we're going to see how it applies according to the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant. All right. Is there a reason why there's a capital letter on yes and amen? Is well, let's get there. Okay. So when we get over to the book of Deuteronomy, this is, this is what's so fun with this, is that when you understand what the words mean, and uh, matter of fact, there, the word amen is, is a universal. Uh, it, is a, it is the one word that is... I can't say every language in the world, but most languages in the world use the word amen. Yep. Even though it's a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word. It's, mm -hmm. it's derived in the Greek. It's a direct transliteration from the Hebrew word amen. There's no change to it. It means the same in Hebrew as it does in Greek. It means the same in Latin as it does in Hebrew. It means the same in Russian as it does in Hebrew. Matter of fact, I checked with the language expert today, and they confirm that in Japanese. <laughs> I know that language. <laughs> you know that language expert. That in Japanese, you know how they say amen in Japanese? Oh, so, amen. You know how they say it in Japanese? Yaman ha. Amen. You know how they say it in Russian? Amen. Amen. Okay. Now there may be some different, you know, stretchings of the syllables and little you know, accents here and there, but it's the same. Amen. How about Norwegian? Amen. Amen. <laughs> the other, but it's the same word. It means the same thing. And, and matter of fact, the word amen is really interesting because amen. there's amen and there's a, a man. You know what the word for amen is? You know what amen in Hebrew means? Amen means believe. Amen believe, means basically be it unto me. When you say amen, you're saying, you know, it's almost, you'll, you'll hear like in a Pentecostal church or some really excited Baptist churches, you know, someone will be preaching and they'll say something really good and someone goes, Amen! What they're saying in that, even though if they they may not be, know what they're saying, but what they're saying in in uh, verbiage is, "Be it unto me." I take that in my life. 
They're agreeing. Now, yes is a word that basically means that's the way it is. So that is said at the beginning. When someone's preaching, they may say yes. It means that's the way it is. But when they say amen, well, that's the way it is, but be that unto me. Say yes and amen. amen. Yes, God is God. Jesus is Lord. Everybody say yes. 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 Now say amen. amen. Be that unto me. And see, I really don't know the difference in the words, but when Mary said, when the angel came to her, the Virgin Mary, and the angel told her all this great stuff, and she had to hear it again, and, and she said, well, how can this be? And the angel explained it. And then what was Mary's response in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, I think it is. Can we put that on the board? Watch this. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. I think that's 28. I don't know. Let me come in. No, let's go to 38. About 10 verses off, Curtis. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. That, that it's a different word in Greek, but it's the same meaning. Be it unto me, as you have said. She might as well said when the, then Mary said, "Amen." It's that same type of confession of belief. When you say "Amen," that means you believe what God has established. You've said yes, God has established it. Now you're saying "Amen." It is all mine. Be it unto me according to your word. So in the book of Deuteronomy, let's just see this, what, how powerful the word amen is. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Now, I, Joy and I, we met in Tulsa during the time of uh, uh, the great faith movement, which it's been going on for ages. But, but in, the, in the early 80s, uh, we were in uh, Tulsa. You couldn't, and, uh, you couldn't get a seat in church unless you got there early. Oh, yeah. There was there was word explosions. People were lined up waiting for the doors to be unlocked. It was awesome. Man, I tell you, well, bring back those days. Why aren't know. people hungry like that anymore? I used to, you know, I'm just a little side note. This won't be part of the book. but I used to get there really early to, to put my Bible. We'd go to conferences. You I'd have get to get up at 5 o'clock to get I, a seat. I'd get like, like early in the morning to get there when the janitors got there. Yeah. They, they'd be cleaning the, the, and I'd sneak in, put my Bible down in a couple seats right up front because I wanted front row seats. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then I'd go back and, you know, and I'd get there in the morning, there's my Bibles in my front row seat, you know, because we're hungry. So anyway, and so we heard a lot about uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, but, uh, and, and, and we understand that, that these are the, the blessings or the promises. Say promises. These are the promises of the Word of God. But what really got my attention was chapter 27. Chapter 27 and verse 11, it says, And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on, and it talks about the six tribes that will be, or the six people that will stand on this mountain. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal. And it talks about another six. In verse 14, it says, And the uh, Levite shall speak with a loud voice and say to all men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a great, uh, carved, uh, carved or molded image an abomination to the Lord, the work of his hands, of his craftsmen, and set it up in secret. <laughs> and all the people shall answer and say, What? Amen. So what saying. were they saying by saying that? Be that curse unto me if I do that. Not anybody else, but if I do that, amen, I receive that curse. They were agreeing with that. They were agreeing with the breaking of the law that if I do, in other words, they're saying, I'm not going to do that. But if I do do that, I'm willing to be cursed. Can you imagine that? Well, guess what? It goes down, verse 16 says, Cursed is the one who treats his, his father and his mother with contempt. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. So in other words, I'm not going to treat my father and mother with contempt. But if I do, I choose to be cursed. 
That's the choice. Either you're going to not do this or you're going to do it. And if you do it, you're saying, amen, I choose to be cursed. Well, what's really odd is that you look at verse 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. There's like 12 or 13 different things here where they all say amen to. That, and now this is in the Old Covenant. Everybody say Old Covenant. Old covenant. In the Old Covenant, they said amen. Be it unto me to every one of the things that bring a curse into their life. They were that aware of the curses because they were under the law. Say under the law. Amen. Now let's just go over one chapter. Verse 28. Verse 1. Now I, I shall... Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set, set you high above all the nations of the earth. Wouldn't you want to say amen to that? Wouldn't you want to say amen to that? There's no amen there, is there? Verse 2. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. Here they go. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Amen. That, where's the amen in Scripture? It's not there. Blessed shall you be in the fruit of the... And if there's no amen to any of the promises. Say promises. promises. Now wait a minute. They said amen under the law to the curses, but they couldn't say amen to the promises. Why? Why? Under the law, there's curses. The Bible says cursed is anyone that lives according to the law. Not blessed. The reason they weren't able to say amen to the promises is because Jesus hadn't showed up yet. Where do we get that from? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are what? Yes. yes. They're established. And what do we say? Amen. Be them unto me. You're saying you receive all the promises that are established in Christ, but Christ hadn't been established under the old covenant. Only until Calvary could they say yes and amen to the promises of God. I know we've taught this before about the promised land living versus the provision land living. They were in the wilderness for 40 years because they did not have faith to enter into the type of living that God wanted them to live in in the promised land. So God sent them to the provision land called the wilderness. He, he provided for them so they could live a long life and die. die. He wanted that type of faith to be dead or that lack of faith, that evil heart of unbelief. He provided. How, and that's what blows me. How many people are living their life waiting for God to provide and walk around the wilderness just walking in circles, just waiting to die? When there's a place called Promised Land where the promises of God are what? Yes, yes. and amen. Christ. We need to understand that in in the Second Corinthians, uh, actually First Corinthians chapter ten. Turn to First Corinthians chapter ten, verse one. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under a cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into whom? They were baptized into Moses. Do you realize that? Under the old covenant, the old covenant 
The laws of the old covenant refer to a group of belong to a group of people who were baptized into Moses. Are you baptized into Moses? No. no. Who are you baptized into? Jesus. You're baptized into Christ. Look at Romans 6 3. Just to give you the references. Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? If you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into Christ. So if you're baptized into Christ, you're also, everything that he went through, you've already went through without going through it. Can I say that again? If you're baptized into what Jesus went through, you're baptized in, you, you have an experience in the realm of the Spirit, what He experienced. You were baptized into Christ, you're baptized into His death, you're baptized into His inheritance. You're baptized into His joy. You're baptized into His kingdom. You're part of Him. Jesus said this, the glory that, he, that was given Him, now He gives to us. Why? Because we're baptized into him. You really should just read the next verses. And, okay, go ahead. Therefore, we were buried with him and through the baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Why? Because we're in the resurrection life that he's in. These are spiritual truth people. Eternal. Spiritual truth realities. For if we have been united together in his likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. You're not baptized into Moses. That's why we read Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Moses is dead. The law is dead. Matter of fact, let me read you a scripture here. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3. Come on, pages. <clears throat> verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. Now, let me just slow down. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evidence. Does, he, does this remind anybody of any, any, another story in Scripture? How about Luke chapter 10, where there was a lawyer that approached Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Let's turn there real quick. Luke chapter 10 is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher. Now remember, a lawyer knows the law. This person is an expert in the Torah. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher. What shall I do to inherit life? That's the first question. And he said to him, What's written in the law? But here's the really good part. And what is your reading of it? Or what is your understanding? What's the law say? And how do you understand what the law says? And so out of everything he knew about the law, what's his response? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And your neighbor as yourself. Well, what was Jesus' response? And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Of course, this is before the, the Calvary. This was before the shedding of the blood. This is the work of the law. But here's the next question that's so important. But he, wanting to justify himself, 
And there's no way you can justify yourself via the law. That was the point of the rest of the story. So in here, so that was the mindset, you know, that people, how can I justify myself? And so in verse 11 in chapter 3 of Galatians, it says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. The just shall live by faith. Faith in what? What you do or faith in what Jesus has done? Faith in the Son of God. It's faith in the Son of God. Yet the law is not of faith. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. The law, I tell you what, they, this just needs to be, there are so many people, hello, they fly. No, just, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> there are so many people that make faith a law. <clears throat> they make a formula. If I do this, I do this, I do this. I should say it this way. They make the law into faith. And you can't do that. There is a law of faith. I mean, there is a, but it's in what Christ has done. It's a, it, the, I love what the scripture says. The work of God is to what? Believe. Our job is to believe. Our job is to say, amen. Because that's what believe. That's what amen, amen, A-M-A-N, really means. It means to believe and say, be it unto me. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. What is them? Say the law. Let me add this. If you're, if you're not scared to write in your Bible, in the side note, when you read this verse, just go ahead and write this. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does live, does them shall live by them, and right there put, and die by them. If you to choose to live by the old covenant law, you're going to be judged by the old covenant law. Yeah. If you use, if you choose to trust the laws of Moses, and stay baptized into Moses, you're not baptized into Christ. And if you're baptized into Christ and you're still following the laws of Moses, you're committing spiritual adultery. And you're not going to bear fruit. You're going to be miserable. You're not going to understand the liberty that Christ has set you free in. You'll be dragging your old husband throughout life. I, I see these pictures. I, I love to... I've actually seen, seen one of these not alive in person, but I've seen the mount of, of two bucks where they get their horns hooked together and one dies and the other one spends the rest of its life dragging the dead carcass around. That one oh, will die too. Yeah. Happens quite The rest of his short life. Yeah, the rest of his short life, yeah. Actually, I've seen it where people are are able to cut the old one off and set them free. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> trying to set you free from that old carcass. Let Moses go, people. Come on. Let me get to the point. <laughs> Yet the law is not of faith. The man who does them shall live by them. For Christ has what? Redeemed us from the what? Curse. What did Deuteronomy chapter 7 say? 27 says, it says, cursed is the man that does these things. Guess what? Those curses were wrapped up in Christ. Let me, let me just read this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So why would we want to live back under the law where there's curses? This is not saying that you can live under the law and there's no curses. This is saying if you live under the law, you're cursed. But Christ has redeemed us from the law so we won't live cursed. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon all Gentiles. Listen, people. <laughs> Hear that on the internet? <laughs> Abraham was before the laws of Moses. 
Look at the, look at the board. <laughs> Abraham is before Moses. So what Jesus did at Calvary took away the laws of Moses to bring us back into the blessings of Abraham. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like what you say. It's it's Father Abraham, not Father Moses. Moses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. So if you're choosing to live under the law, you're choosing to live under the curse of the law. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith, not the law. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them and live in a cursed life. I don't know how much clearer that can be. But somehow people don't see the separation between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In Him, there's yes and amen. In Him is yes, and in Him is amen. So if you're baptized into Christ, there's yes. The promises are established. And in Him, there's also the be it unto me. It's, not, it's one thing to say, yes, I believe in the promises, but it's another thing for you to say, be it unto me. Amen. Are we saying amen to the promises of the Word of God? Well, let me show you something about the promises of the Word of God. In 2 Peter, and I know those that are here have heard this many times, guess what? You're going to hear it again. Repetition is good. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of... Now, wait a minute. See, there's lots of... Look at this. Everybody can see that? Lots of knowledge. See this on YouTube? Lots of knowledge of God. There's some knowledge in here that will create fear, will cause you to back up, think about judgment and wrath and, and being killed, all kinds of things. But this says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the what? Knowledge. In the knowledge. In other words, there's certain knowledge in the word of God that will produce grace and peace. There's other knowledge that won't produce grace and peace. There's other knowledge that will produce works of law. And fear of judgment if you break that law. Do you see that? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the, can, the new covenant knowledge. Can we just say that? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given, has, has given to us what? Say all things. All things. That's not old covenant. This is new covenant knowledge that pertain to what? Life and Godliness. Through the what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Through the right knowledge. To the new covenant knowledge. To the right side of the cross, not the left side of the cross. Of him who called us by glory and what? Virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Where have the promises been given? In Christ. That through these what? Promises. Through these great and precious promises. That through those great and precious promises. Through the great and precious promises. We that are in Christ. Partake of the promises that are in Christ. 
that we may be takers of the divine nature. What's divine nature? It's called godly nature. It's God's nature. That's what divine. God put his divine nature in the promises that are in Christ that's been given to us in Christ. Not in the law, but in Christ. And that when we experience this divine nature, as we experience the promise of the God, let me put it this way, the more promises you experience, the more God you experience. Going to church and getting goosebumps is, is, isn't experiencing God. Experiencing the promises manifested in your life is experiencing God. That we may be partakers of the divine nature. And what's that going to do to us? It's going to cause us to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. See, when you receive the... Listen. I keep wanting to say McFly. Sorry. Back to the future movie. The only reason we have lust in our life is because we're not experiencing the goodness of God in that area in our life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not what? You shall not want. If you really understand the Lord is there to take care of you through his promises, you will not have a desire outside of his will for your life. And you won't want some, you won't lust after something. You won't have a want in your heart for something he's not providing. The only reason you have a want for something outside of the Word of God for your life is because you're not seeing Him as your provider in that area of your life. Does everybody understand that? And when you experience the promises of God, I tell you what, what you thought was ple when you experience the pleasure of the Lord, what you thought was bringing you pleasure in the world is no comparison. When you experience the pleasure of the Lord in His presence and in what, I tell you, when you know you've spoken the Word of God, and I, there's no greater feeling for me when I know that I know that I know that I nailed it, that I spoke what God wanted me to speak. I just, when I just sit back and listen to myself and know that it's God speaking through me, man, that's the greatest feeling. Man, I can't, getting a hole in one wouldn't even make the, you know, give me that kind of, there's people that I know that used to get high on drugs and stuff, and when they get when they get spirit filled, and they start operating the things of God, and they see God working through them, mm -hmm. and they see someone's leg grow out, or someone gets saved, or whatever, because of God using them, that's a greater high than any drug they've ever experienced. Amen. Man, when you realize the promises of God are greater than any, they will literally take the lust of this world out of your life. Let me read this again. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Man. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. See, in him the promises are what? Yes. And a man. Yes, I agree that they're in Christ. But amen. Be enough to me. Any, every time you hear a promise being preached, you should just go, Amen! Mm. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Man. The more promises you experience, the more freedom from this world. Remember, this whole thing is taking the chains off of freedom. I believe the body of Christ is full of people that have heard about the promises of God, but they've never said amen to them. They hear the promises of God is preached. Everything that was done through the redemption of Christ but they've never said amen. They've never said, I believe. Be it unto me. And then lived that way. 
Man. The thing I want to point out probably most of all here is on this side you have the order of Levi. On the left side of the cross you have the order of Levi. This is where Moses, the law of Moses, you can see it on the cross, but on the, on the board, but, but on this side you have Jesus. Over here you have Moses. Over here you have Jesus. Again, I'm going to say it again out loud. The battle that most people deal with is not between the devil or good and bad. You know, that's the knowledge of good and evil. You realize it came from the tree. We weren't supposed to have that anyway. But now, it's a battle between Moses and Jesus. Which one are you going to follow? Are you baptized into Jesus and following Moses? Mm -hmm. But according to Scripture in Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to be bringing up this more and more and more and more. Actually, I'm going to start reading it. Chapter 6, verse 20. Verse 19, sorry, Joy. <laughs> this hope we have is an anchor. I should go ahead and read the, all the way to third. I'm not going to. For this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Your soul is your thoughts, your feelings, your emotion, and your will. And the hope that he's talking about here is the confidence that God cannot lie, and they swore between God and Jesus to do what they're going to do. They made a covenant between the two of them, between God and Jesus' his Son, and they made a covenant, and we are the recipients of that covenant, and we have our hope in that. Hope is a confident expectation of good things to come. You can read that starting at verse 13, above that and all the way down. Verse 18 says, but that by two immutable things it was impossible for God to lie, which we might have strong consolation who have fled for a refuge to lay hold of this hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of our soul. Your emotions should be steadfast. No matter what's happened in the world, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions should be centered on the hope and what, uh, that, that expectation of the covenant that God made between Jesus and himself. You should have so much, yes, um, that, that's where my, your emotions aren't on politics. Your emotions aren't on the stock market. Your emotions aren't on what's happened in the world. You can pray about those things. You need to know what's going on about those things, but your hope is in the covenant God made with Jesus and God himself, and not on that. It says, both sure and steadfast, which just enters the presence behind the veil. What's an anchor do? It keeps you stable in a storm. It keeps you on the honey spot when you're fishing. It keeps you stable. You may be rocking a boat, but you're not moving. You're still right there where you're supposed to be. We're not going to get into that. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest. He's high priest, right? Forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. There's an order of Melchizedek. Over here you have an order of Levi and Aaron based on the laws of Moses. The old covenant. Over here you have an order of Melchizedek based on the laws. And Jesus was a priest according to the order of Melchizedek according to the laws of the new covenant. there's Over here, there's 10 commandments. Over here, there's two. Over here, there's 613 laws. Over here, there's five laws. Over here, these laws are laws of the flesh, the scripture says. That's why no, no one will be justified by the laws of the flesh because they're flesh. These are laws of the spirit. These five... People are saying, well, I don't know, Joyce going to put them on there probably without me even looking. But one of them is the law for the, the law of the spirit. <laughs> How do we know that's a spiritual law? I don't know. Let's, let's, let's read Romans 8 too. <laughs> for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Because it says it's a law of the spirit. It's a spiritual principle. It's a spiritual law. 
Every one of the laws of the new covenant are spiritual laws. Everything in the old covenant, laws of Moses, is a fleshly law. And the Bible calls the law the law of the flesh. But over here we have the law, of Mel the order of Melchizedek. I've heard people preach and teach that in the millennial reign there's going to be sacrifices. <laughs> no, there's not. There's not going to be sacrifices in the millennial reign. Why? Can everybody know? Then everybody knows the scripture, but it says Jesus is the what? Final. Say final. Final, final sacrifice. Amen. That kind of nails it on the point. And by the way, all the other sacrifices and all the other feasts before that was the type and shadow of Jesus himself. It was all a shadow of Jesus. Like the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't a day, people. It was a day. But it was a shadow of Jesus that we rest in. Read Hebrews chapter 4. It's all about how there's a rest that remains because they didn't enter into it and they had the law. They couldn't enter into it. But did they keep the Sabbath? Did they, help you. Did they keep the Sabbath in the Old Covenant? Say yes. Yes, they did. Yeah. yeah. But were they at rest? Say no. But they perverted. They did not enter the rest because the Sabbath they treated as a day instead of a promise of a rest. Matter of fact, I'll just read it. Romans chapter four. I mean Hebrews chapter four. This one page. For since a promise remains, say promise. promise. And what are we talking about? The promises of God or what? Yes, and amen. See, God put a promise in the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not the promise. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not, uh, heard did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith. Faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore in my rest, they shall not enter my rest. That's Psalms 95. Although the works were finished, <laughs> I love this, from the foundations of of the world. God had planned. Matter of fact, uh, the, it even says in Galatians that, that the scriptures never intended for the Gentiles to be under the law. Never. You want a scripture for that? Let me read that real quick. In the book of Galatians. Oh, my pages. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Not just descendants, just not genealogy, but you've got to be of faith. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached, how? By faith, not by the law. Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you shall the nations shall be blessed. So that those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God was going to justify the Gentiles, not by the law, but by what? Faith. Hey, man, I tell you. So back over here in Hebrews chapter 4, let me just read this again. Verse 1, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, and you can put that rest to Sabbath, because Sabbath rest, that's the purpose of the Sabbath, will take a what? A rest. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested, he rested but they, then they called it the Sabbath. But the day was called the day of what? Rest. rest. So the Sabbath, the purpose of the Sabbath was what? Rest. 
from works. That sounds like a new covenant life, not an old covenant life. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, at least any one of you seem to have come short of it. I love that. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed, see there's the faith, do enter. And now what's that word? Now in the Greek it's different, but in the Hebrew it's amen. It's A-M-A-N. And amen is A-M-E-N. And believing and say, say, being unto me and believing are just so close. You can't say amen without believing. You can't say amen without believing it's already accomplished in Christ. Not in your works, but in him. I tell you, although the works were finished when? Before the foundations of the world. I, I just got to read this one. In Ephesians chapter 1. I got to read this one. I got to get back into Melchizedek real quick. Chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. In heavenly places. Where? In Christ. How many people are baptized into Christ? Yes. So you have every spiritual blessing in, heav in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. in Christ. You have everything that you have need of in Christ. Joint heirs to the Father. You have the inheritance, your joint heirs. You're, you're, you're seated in Christ. We can't get into that tonight. Having, uh, verse 4, just as He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Someone's getting that right now. If you want to live in your past, go back further. Go back further than your high school years. Go back further than your conception in this earth. Go all the way back. Don't go back to your granddaddy. Don't go back to your forefathers. Go all the way back before creation. And see that you were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. That you should be holy, without blame, before him. Not in judgment but in love. Somebody needs to hear that. You're worried about standing before him in judgment. You need to see yourself standing before him in love. The reason you're worried about judgment is you've been listening to the old covenant. And it's stolen your liberty. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I've said this for a year. God is just looking for people that would love his love. Man, when you start thinking that way, do you love his love? Most people are so focused on his judgment, they didn't, they're not seeing his love. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery not the history the mystery the more you learn about the order of Melchizedek, the new covenant laws, the message of the kingdom of heaven on this earth that Jesus and Paul taught, 
dealing with the kingdom on this earth. Not going to heaven, but living in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, you're going to go to heaven one day when you die, but you're coming back to earth for at least a thousand years to rule and reign on earth in your glorified body. And after that, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and I don't know what's going to happen then. <laughs> I don't care. It'll be good. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his, uh, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together all in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's all of us in him. Are you in him? Yes. That's the qualification. Because if you're in him, you have his promises. You have his spirit. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also have believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In him, people. In him, the promises of God are what? Yes, yes and amen. The curses are done. And the promises are fulfilled in him. The question I have for you, are you going to say, Amen. Yes. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get us together together in this your place. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're helping us repent, change the way we think, to line up with your wisdom and your logic. And may we be free. May we stand in the liberty in which Christ has made us free. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Very good, Jerry. You got it. Amen. I believe, and so be it to me. And everybody online is saying, Amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ Righteousness, and the Finished Work of the Cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at Joy-Coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.